David Bogdanov seemed very smug, like he felt like he had this handled. He didn't appear, at least from my perspective, like that he felt guilty or that he was sad. I looked into his eyes. I don't think he ever looked at us. He admitted that he didn't tell Nikki to get out of the vehicle and she walked away unharmed. He claimed that they became sexual and during the sexual encounter, he learned that Nikki had male genitalia and he then stopped the encounter. Oh, you yeah. gotta push her, push her back and you start freaking out saying, you didn't tell me you're a dude. And that she and he then began in a struggle David says at this point, Nikki goes for his gun that he kept up in the front of his vehicle. And so David tells the courtroom that he felt his life was at risk. This is a completely new revelation. And all I can think is, oh my God, I'm gonna get shot right now. David then says he grabbed the nearest thing he could, which was a phone charging cord in the front of his vehicle. He said the only way to restrain Nikki, he claims, was by holding the cord up against her shoulders. I, I grabbed that cable and put it around her and pulled her back like that and hold her, hold her from, from going, keep going forward for the gun. When pressed about this fact, well, how did the cord go up around her neck and tie in a knot? David's only excuse was the cord slipped up around her neck on accident in the scuffle. Investigators and the prosecutors knew that wasn't true because the cord wasn't just around her neck, it was tied in a knot around her neck. During the trial, I heard David, you know, lie about Nikki and not have any remorse, you know. That was pretty devastating. I don't know what I was expecting. I just was expecting him to be a little bit sorry. And he wasn't. I think that the violence is all precipitated by him finding out that she's transgender. And so to me, it feels very much like a trans panic defense with a self-defense spin. The gay or trans panic defense is difficult because you basically have to have a, a mental health expert who's gonna be testifying for the defense, who's gonna say that the defendant upon learning that uh, the victim was either gay or transgender, and that this caused them such a mental state that they were either not aware of what they were actually doing or that they were not able to discern between right and wrong. That's an incredibly high bar to reach. When David did his first police interview in October, when he sat down and denied knowing what happened to Nikki, he said something that was very pivotal in the investigation and something that really stuck out to investigators as far as a motive. For me, it's even disturbing when I'm around a gay person or somebody bi or transsexual or something, you know, so I just got disgusted and I asked her to just get out. He used the words shocked and disgusted to investigators that really stood out that this could have been motivated by hatred for the fact that Nikki was transgender, ultimately a hate crime. So I was taught that uh, it is a sin and it's not okay. I was angry. I was hurt. I was devastated. I don't normally project hatred, but I had hatred for him. When he took the stand, it was very obvious that he did not have remorse. The only tears he cried were talking about how it felt to have had sex with someone with a penis. He's not emotional about the fact that he killed a teenager. He's emotional because he's embarrassed for what his family might think of what happened. First thing I think is that you call police. And, and then I think that they're not gonna believe me. You know, I've been up all night, not sober. The dead person's in the back seat. At that point, I thought I need to get rid of the body. And so he tried to get rid of as much evidence as he could and, and fled the area. He just turned out to be a monster. Just a monster who had hatred inside of him. And he killed my baby.